if your process is pretty good, so you have a high CPK, can you then get away with a worse measuring device? Or do you actually need better devices to keep that high level? Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And this is an answer to a question posed by a fellow Tom right here on this channel. And he asked me, how are R&R and CPK linked? So do they have something uh, like I saw in this textbook, which is that a CPK of uh, 1.6, that or better that does allow you to have you know something between a, a 10 to 20 10 to 30 percent on your r and r score uh, but if you have a cpk of 1.3 then you really should go for lower than 10 percent um, more than 30 percent is never really good so there's this sort of connection that it didn't fully grasp between what r and r do i need for different cpks and there are actually quite a number of facets to this question because, in fact, a higher or a better, so that's a lower R&R percentage, it will improve your CPK. So they are linked. You cannot, based on CPK, determine the R&R, nor the other way around. But it is indeed true that when the CPK is higher, you've got more wiggle room. So on the one hand, a good measuring device improves your CPK and also a good, a higher CPK makes it less valuable that you really have such a good measurement device. Let's dive into that. And then first, you know, let's check a bit what is the CPK and get the r, &R on there because I feel that this, this topic isn't understood well enough when we talk with the people about Six Sigma and what the CPK thingy actually does. Now, in general, we, we have this measure, and I'm not even going to put values here, but there is a lower and an upper specification limit. So either internally or a customer, we put some specifications on our process. Now we have two lines making the same product. We have the purple and the green line, and the purple line, it, uh, it actually free standard deviations from the mean. So it's free that way, free that way. Generally, when I draw uh, one of these normal distributions, I only draw it out to free standard deviations, even though, of course, it will continue indefinitely. These lines should also continue. But generally, I draw only free standard deviations. And what you then get is that we sort of say the whole process as if free standard deviations in both directions would be the whole process, but it fits exactly within my specification limits, my tolerance limits. So that has a process capability of one. The green process, it is much tighter. In fact, it is so tight that this here, it can fit within my specification limits twice. So this has a process capability of two. Now you might say it's not fully centered, so it should be a bit less, but that's just my drawing. It means that we have quite a lot of wiggle room. Another way of looking at it is that from the mean, there are six standard deviations before we hit any of the tolerance limits. Now, we generally do not expect any or at least almost no products to go up to that sixth sigma. That is such a rarity that you basically say, you know, the chance is zero. The thing is, our process might move a bit and before we see that it has moved and uh, before we've taken corrective actions, a process with a lower CPK may have already generated a defect. That's the main reason to get a high CPK. So this 1.67 or this 2 CPK is not because you want absolutely all parts within specification. Well, that is the end goal, but it's not because you need that tight tolerance. It is so that you know that the factory supplying these things, they have enough wiggle room so that they can sense a change in the process. But okay, that is the CPK thing. Now, what is this whole r, &R? This is a part of measurement systems analysis. So this is only about the measurement system. It is not about the process. But the thing is, we would like to see the process results, right? The truth. But any measurement we do will also have a bit of variability, a bit of 
in precision. So there is this gauge, so there is this measure of a measurement. So we check how repeatable, how reproducible R and R a gauge, so any type of measurement equipment, is. And what that means is that when we have this process, and I'll start with the CPK2 process, actually this part came out of our line, but our measurement also has you know, a little bit of variation. So it might register as this one, it might register as here. On average, it will register that in the center, but that means that we introduce a little bit more variation. Now, an R&R of 10% means that we introduce about 10% more variation, observed variation, in what we see as test results than the process is actually giving. So of all the variation we see, about 10% comes from the way we measure it and not from the machine making it. This will go in a bit, out a bit, so that's why it doesn't fully move your curve, but it does broaden it a bit. So let's say that we have a 30% R&R, &R, because th this are, these are the things, right? If you're not too familiar with R&R, &R, basically we strive to have measurement devices that have an R&R &R percentage of lower than 10%, but we also say that between 10 and 30% might be acceptable. It's a bit based on the process, the conditions, and what we're trying to do. And that is exactly what is going to come back in here. But I'll, I'll take 30% because of that. So we've got this free sigma thingy, and, and that means I can you know, draw out a bit more variation into it. And I've added about 30% everywhere over the whole line. This is what we observe. So any measurement might be between those two. Now, what you now already see is that we're getting closer to our tolerance limits. That means that if your measurement system is not too great, we are going to artificially reduce our observed process capability because we're getting less wiggle room. It also means, by the way, that if we're getting closer to the specification limit, we are going to throw away some products that may actually have been within specifications. And the other way around as well, we may have tested some products that actually would not have made specs, but because our measuring device just you know, measured them a bit smaller this time, pure luck, it still fell within the tolerance limits. So we're sending a defective product to the customer, not knowing that we did this. You will see this effect popping up a lot more when you have more spread, more variation. So with this CPK of one graph, I will also add in 30% more spread due to our measurement device. And what we see here is that with that one, with the, the CPK that is very close already, so this low CPK, when your variation is very close already to your tolerance limits, when you also have a problem, so to say, in your measurement system, you're going to hit over it a lot. You're also going to have a, an observed CPK that is a lot lower. This observed CPK will be in the order of 0 0.7, 0 0.67. That will be roughly what we're gonna see if we know that in truth we would have had a CPK1 process, but there is no way to 100% measure that accurately. We have a measurement system that is about 30% adding more variation. We go way over. So here you get your basic answer, Tom, to your question. This is why a low CPK process really needs that short, that, that very small bandwidth in its measuring system and why a high CPK process can handle a bit more. Now, why is this 1.33 mentioned? Well, in fact, if you do this with a 1.33 CPK and you add about 25% percent 
uh, based on the measurement system, 25 to 30 percent, you end up with a CPK of one, and you end up with what is basically the bare minimum of acceptability. So, I think the table you shared it gives a good first estimation, uh, but it is more to make you think about the situation, because also with a CPK of 1.3. I would not be too happy to have a measurement system that is seriously getting closer to 30%. I'll try to keep it as close to 10% as well. But indeed, when the CPK goes up, you have the wiggle room. And it might be a lot cheaper to just have a, a quick but not so accurate measurement device in the, uh, on the line so that you can just do your quick checks and you can get that process shift out there more cheaply, quickly, done by the operator. So that, that's a bit the thing. You never, on purpose, want to make your measurement system less capable, have less re uh, repeatability, reproducibility. But if it is a very nice trade-off, so if that suddenly means that you can do a lot more measurements or that you can do them directly in line, it may really be a nice trade-off. Now, a word on the r, &R percentage. You see, there is this idea that the r, &R percentage needs to be lower than 10 or well 10 to 30 may be okay higher than 30 really not okay but also keep in mind that you can get this r, &R by dividing the extra variance that you get from the measurement system by the total variance you observe in the process or by dividing it by the tolerance limits now the first version so dividing it by the the spread by the variance that you see in the process itself is generally preferred but as i explained also in previous videos you should do them both so you should do both of the comparisons and i think that this will give you as good as an indication as this whole table with the cpk if you have a measurement system that gives you and let's take the, the cpk2 case here but you've got a measurement system that gives you about 20% uh, of the observed variation in your process comes from the measurement system. So you have a R and R of 20%. Not super, also not really bad. In this example, a 20% gap here would be about 10% of tolerance limits because of the whole CPK thing. So you know that based on tolerance limits, we've actually got a very nice measurement system. So we've got a uh, okay-ish and good, and you add those together. If you have a measurement system so that gives you an r, r of less than 10% based on the process variation and less than 10% based on the tolerance, then you've got a great system. You know, you are very sure that everything is going fine. If you have a measurement system that has 10% on one of those two and not more than 30% on the other, and almost always, but we'll get to the, uh, the exception, almost always that will mean that based on the observed variance, it will be a bit worse and based on the tolerances, it will be bigger. Um, but if it then uh, sorry, the, based on tolerance, the, uh, the percentage will be lower, the result will be better. So if you then have, based on tolerances, it's lower than 10%, based on the process variation itself, it's 20-ish, maybe even going up to 30, you have a bit of a choice. Do we really need it? Probably it is okay enough for us, and we should not invest time and effort into improving the measurement system, right? This, that is the thing that we are discussing that that is what we want to know is my measurement system good do i need to improve it so is it good enough for what i'm trying to do and only if it is not good enough for what i'm trying to do how can i improve it what should i do because improvement also costs time and effort and if you have either of those two go over 30 percent then you basically really need to do something because then you almost certainly are worsening, really worsening your situation due to a non-precise measurement system. Then the sort of, I hope, edge case, when is your r, &R better when you compare it to the data of your process than when you compare it 
to your tolerance limits? Well, that is if your CPK is less than one. So if you actually have more spread than your tolerance limit, so th this is already not a very nice position to be in. I mean, a CPK of 0 0.67 means you've got only two standard deviations from your norm. In some applications, this will be accepted, but it's generally not recommended. Or when you have a, a process that is uh, way out of whack, so it's really not centered, even though it should be capable, you will see a difference between this table with the CPKs and the RNRs and the method I just explained. I don't think that that difference is important enough to really go and nitpick the CPK. So that is my uh, advice to anyone doing the RNR: make sure that you compare the extra variation due to the measurement system, both to the observed variance and the tolerance limits. Both of them should ideally be under 10%. If one of them is under 10% and the other is, you know, 20-ish, maybe max up to 30, probably it will be okay for you. If either one of those two goes over 30, you probably want to invest in your measurement system. So I hope you like that explanation. If you have any other questions about KHRNR, CPK, how all those Six Sigma things work together, please, you know, ask them in the comments below. As you see, I like to also answer your questions. It gives me you know, the, the feedback and the inspiration that I need to know what our community would like to have some more explanation on. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. For now, I leave you with improving your CPK and doing that with a good measurement system. And as always, I also wish that you enjoy that improvement journey.